Welcome to episode 14 of When Life Gives You Lemons, Go Vegan. This podcast celebrates and shares people's incredible stories of recovery after making the transition to a low-fat, whole-food vegan lifestyle. And I am your host, Corinne Nidja. This week's episode is with holistic nutritionist and gut engineer Natalie Woodman, who shares her incredible story and so much fascinating information about gut health, the microbiome, and how to eat to feed the good bacteria in our guts to promote incredible health and keep our bodies happy. Plus, so much more. It was a really great interview. I could have talked to Natalie all day. I love learning about the gut and learning about gut health because, as Natalie says in this interview, up to 70 to 80% of our immune system is comprised of the bacteria in our gut and if they're happy or unhappy and all those kinds of things. And so it's super fascinating to me to figure out, like, you know, if we can feed our guts what they need and feed the bacteria in their guts what they love to thrive, the good bacteria, so much more is possible for our health. So, yeah, this is a great interview and I hope you really enjoy it. Thank you so much, Natalie. Enjoy, everyone. Hello. Hello, Natalie. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me on your uh, podcast. You're so welcome. So, yeah, if you could just give us all a bit of your background and how you got into being a nutritionist, dietitian and focusing on gut health, that'd be great. I started out actually as a a speech and drama teacher and uh, used to teach secondary and then ended up over in Japan for 15 years. We went for one year. We went over with one child and we came back with three children, two cars, two cats and a house full of furniture. So we went over there and and we taught and then we came back in uh, sort of when I was about 37, 38. And in Japan, we lived, if you know much about the Japanese diet, we lived a really healthy diet. There was really, there's no meat to be had there. It's very expensive. We had some fish but it was mostly plant-based, seasonal, and you shopped every day because there was no space and they didn't have canned goods. It was always fresh. There was just nothing. There was not a chocolate aisle. There was only a rice cracker aisle and it was all very healthy. And so that's how we, uh, you know, I raised my children there. Very, very healthy. And then I came back to Perth and got into uh, being um, an executive dean of a of an international school and work got really, really busy and very, very stressful. And I was eating what I felt was, you know, fairly healthy, you know, wake up in the morning, have some yogurt and some fruit and then at lunchtime, so maybe some cans of tuna or some, you know, leftover chicken or chops from the night before with a nice salad and dinner, pasta and a bolognese sauce. So nothing that you would Things that I grew up on that I that you would never say, oh, well, you're eating maccas or you're you're doing this all the time. So no wonder. And I just started watching my health deteriorate, and I was probably like drinking a bit too much too because I was very very stressed. Anyway, gradually I started getting uh, chronic allergies. So the hay fever, you were just like nose running, eyes swollen, terrible hay fever chronic eczema. I used to sleep. I used to have ice packs in the fridge that I moulded to the shape of my arm. In fact, they were moulded over uh, old wine bottles. So that, that's maybe a, the drunkard's way of doing it. And I used to have them in the fridge. And so I'd take them out at night. I'd have about 10 on the run that I would lay them over my arm at night when I was sleeping because the itching would keep me up. And as well as if I itch too much, I would scratch the skin raw and I'd wake up with like blood on the sheets and on my arms. And then the worst part was is that my back started to be getting chronically sore and I would get out of bed sort of on an angle and couldn't move. You know, I'd put on weight, but nothing again. You know, I wasn't, I've got, I'm a fairly small frame, you know, I'm five foot four. I sort of always hovered around 50, 52 kilos, but I was hitting about 70 kilos, which for most people would think, oh, I'm 70 and it's not bad, but it is on a very small frame. It's it's a lot of weight. My back got progressively worse until I basically would go down for two weeks at a time and I literally couldn't get out of bed. I, well, I would have to roll out of bed on all fours, crawl to the toilet, grab myself up, sit on the toilet, you know, do a wee or whatever, and then come out and not even, I couldn't have a shower, I couldn't do anything. And everyone around me seemed to think that that 
what I was going through was really quite normal. By that stage, I was about 40, 42, 44, and everyone said to me, oh, yeah, well, that happened. Yeah, I've put on weight too. It's that perimenopause. Yeah, I've got allergies now. It's part and parcel and all these things. And I thought, this is crazy. So still didn't change anything that I was doing, which I think is what a lot of people do. You sort of think, well, I'm doing the right thing, so there's no need to change. And then I had a huge attack in my back that I went down for about four weeks and it was about the last week and I was craw- by that stage I was crawling to the, the toilet and one night I crawled to the toilet and just as I sat down I had this most chronic back spasm that I that it was so painful that I passed out. And when I woke up, I was on the ground on the bathroom. My husband said, what happened? And the light was off because we had the light from the bedroom into the ensuite. And I just said, oh, I'm, I can't move. My back has seized up. I had a chronic pain. So he went, he said, look, I'll get a pillow. And he went to lift my head and he said, oh, it's all wet. Did you land in the shower? Because, we, you know, he'd had a shower. And I said, no. He said, I'm going to put on the light. And it was just this big pool of blood this massive pool of blood, and he said, oh, my God, and I'd gone right through the, the middle of the shower screen, edge of the shower screen and split my skull and through my eyebrow right near my eye open. And he said, I've got to get an ambulance. So the ambulance came and they were like, um, oh, look, if you could just get up because we can't get the stretcher in there. And I said, look, it's not my head. I can't move. So went to the thing and they were like, oh, it's just a back spasm, but we'll just sew your head up. So they sewed my head up. Friends came to visit me. They bought me things like little packs of Snickers bars and Mars bars and a a six-pack of vodka and some wine and get well soon. And I laid in bed and I just thought, this is ridiculous. This can't be my life. This, you know, I mean, at that stage I had a, like a 13-year-old, an 18-year-old and a... Uh, 21 year old so I was in bed and I just started googling about you know eating healthy and doing this and you know what was wrong with the things that I was eating maybe or I'm sure the drinking didn't help but (laughs) and came across nutrition um, at Curtin University and so I said to my husband look I'm going back to study because there's something I just don't know so I did a year at Curtin and And look, all power to them, you know, that's lovely, but they're very much about, you know, maybe, you know, have butter and margarine and do this and cut the fat off your your steak. And it was very much that pyramid, that very standard pyramid of becoming a nutritionist for a hospital or to a dietitian for a hospital or the infirmed or a special diet for ulcerative colitis or whatever. And I just thought, this is wrong. This is making, and everybody in the class was unhealthy. And I'm like, if you know, so don't tell your clients not to have Coke, tell them to have zero Coke, you know, like the one with zero sugar. And I just thought, this is just ass about face. This is ridiculous. So I left there and enrolled in the um, Australian Institute of Holistic Medicine in naturopathy, holistic nutrition, Western herbal medicine. And started doing that. And immediately I was surrounded by a bunch of people that nobody was eating meat. I must have been the only one there. I was like, they looked at me like, oh, you know, like, you know, (laughs) oh, you you demon. And it actually wasn't even about, uh, I don't, there was a couple of people that were about, about the animal cruelty and that's where they had started. But most people, it was about the health that they'd noticed the change. So I sort of thought, well, I've got nothing to use and I was learning in, you know, um, in naturopathy and in nutritional medicine about the power of plants. And and that, and that we all know that nobody says to their doctor, uh, when, when they go, go to their doctor and they get really sick, the doctor doesn't ever say, look, I want you to go home and up your intake of bacon, meat, butter, and all the rest of it. They say to you, look, I want you to go home and I want you to intake, you know, your veggies and your fruits and, you know, you know, your grains and your whole foods and things like that. So we do know it, but somehow we, we think just a little bit of that is okay. Anyway, as it uncovered and then I started getting following some gastroenterologists and doctors 
in America that were following about the gut microbiome, I really just started to change the way I ate and gone with the yogurt and the chicken and the meat and all the rest of it. And I don't know about you because I know you've had your own health journey, but I actually forgot that I was sick. All of a sudden, the eczema was gone and the hay fever was gone and I was getting out of bed without pain and upright and not having to be in pain and take Panadols all the time. And I I sort of, I didn't even put two and two together. I just sort of thought, oh, okay, it's all disappeared. But, and then I actually went, I started, would go to a barbecue at a friend's house and whatever, and it was just all too hard to eat plant-based because everyone was like, oh, you know, how do you survive? Oh, you poor thing. And and I thought, oh, well, I'll just have, doesn't hurt, a couple of drumsticks, chicken or a lamb chop. And almost immediately, and I am talking about the next day, I'd start sneezing again. I'd wake up itchy again. I'd get out of bed just at a bit of an angle. And I thought, this is crazy. Then having finished my studies and and graduated as a nutritionist, holistic nutritionist, not the sort of uh, the nutritionists that come out of general university educated, you know, the nutritional dietitian and naturopathy, I delved into the gut microbiome and learned that we are more bacteria than human. And it's our bacteria, this inner ecosystem, much like a rainforest looks like. And if you can picture a rainforest and see how lush it is, and there's a beautiful ecosystem, and it's not about good or bad, it's about that beautiful balance. The spider eats the fly and then the, the, you know, the snake eats the, the, you know, the spider and things live off different plants. And it's all this beautiful ecosystem. And I realised that what I turned my ecosystem is in was some like the decimated forest in the Amazon or the things that have been ploughed down for, you know, palm plantations in, you know, Asian countries. And I realised that there was only one thing that feeds our beneficial gut bacteria, and that is fibre. And I was like, it was just like an aha moment, and I'm thinking, well, there is no fibre in the yoghurt. There is no fibre in a lamb chop. There is no fibre in a piece of fish. There is no fibre in all these things. And as well as what also is, so I thought, okay, so that's the key to feeding my gut microbiome and keeping that healthy. But what are the things that are going to disrupt my gut microbiome? And that were things like, even though they were plant-based, they were the sources that were full of preservatives and emulsifiers and all those sorts of they weren't a whole food they were just a concoction of all these different things and I'd still had some of those in my diet and when I started weeding those out then the massive transformation came in that I didn't even think about my weight anymore I went down came back from 70 kilos back to you know 52 53 or 54 you know hovering around a healthy weight feeling feeling great and so I thought okay this is it this is what I have to do with my clients I am no longer and previous to that I'd been going oh okay we'll give you some vitamin b's we'll give you some omega-3s we'll give you this we'll give you that and I was like that's that's basically like giving a panadol for a for a migraine or a headache Yes, it's a very sort of sometimes a helpful cut through because no one wants to be in pain and sometimes sleeping is more important than being in pain. So there's that little middle ground that you've got to sort of have. But what it's really about is, no, what are the core things that are causing that vitamin B deficiency? Well, our gut bacteria make vitamin B. They make two vitamins, vitamin K and vitamin B, and you're not going to really know about cut vitamin K unless you lose a, a leg because it's blood clotting. So most people don't know whether they're deficient until it push comes to shove for that one. But vitamin B is, we know, because our energy levels. And then the gut microbiome balances mood, appetite, and sleep. 95% of our serotonin, the feel-good neurotransmitter, is located in the epithelial cells of our gut. Our immune system, 70 to 80% of our immune system inside the gut. So when you could feed those, 
then they basically, so when the beneficial gut bacteria flourished, I flourished. And when they struggled, I struggled. So I just had to go, okay, well, who do I want to feed? And then I started thinking about this is really about like feeding a child. You would never start a child on uh, solids or straight away, or you would never give them a steak. You know, you'd give them veggies and you'd mush them up. And yet we seem to forget about what we nurtured ourselves as children. Like you don't start kids on pieces of meat or fish. You know, you start them on a bit of rice cereal or, you know, some sort of whole cereals sort of softened with a bit of water or you some, you know, veggies. And so I started getting clients and I basically sort of shut down my practice, retooled to give my clients everything they needed from meal plans to recipes to shopping lists to support to educational sort of uh, videos about looking after their gut. And I would basically said, well, you're not coming to see me until I have a 20-minute chat with you first because if you're not willing to change things, and I'm only asking you for 56 days, I'm not asking you to commit any more than that, but I'll give all the tools you need. So it's sort of like learning a language or learning anything. And I've had clients with, you know, um, autoimmune, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, um, osteoarthritis, um, arthritis, all sorts of manners of things, irritable bowel syndrome, and the ones that said, yep, I'm in. And I said, okay, this is what you've got to eat. And they started doing it. And what I would realised before was is that the struggle for most people in making that transition is that they don't know how or what to do. And you can spend hours Googling things of what to do or recipes or whatever and putting together bits and pieces. But it was the same as me. It, unless you have the tools, it's like learning a new sport. Unless you, you know, if you're playing hockey, unless you've got the knee pad, you know, the, the knee pads and the hockey stick and the shoes and, and the mouth guard and, and some idea about how the game is played, you're probably going to get it wrong and hurt yourself more than you are doing it. So how the gut microbiome works is very much how nature works, which is weeding out the pathogenic bacteria, i.e. not giving them anything that's going to make them grow and giving everything. And you know what that is? It's a whole food, plant-based diet. And it's so simple. And in fact, when I realised how simple I was, I thought, this is crazy. This is this is easier than anything I've ever done. But I think what stops most people is they don't know how. You know, where do you start? How do you do it? And this is why I love, you know, to share stories with other people about other people because if you've got the support, and that's what I tell people, get the support. It doesn't need to have to be from me. It can be from someone that you resonate with that has been there and done that and and have them as a mentor and have them as a guiding practice and have them to, to you know, give you tips and things, then the journey is, is seamless. It's basically shop, cook and eat. And the transformation, and I'm telling you, in 56 days, that's the transformation when you can get your gut microbiome, the beneficial gut bacteria that secrete short-chain fatty acids that are anti-inflammatory. So people go, oh, but I need omega-3 from fish. No, you don't. And in most fish now, there is no omega-3 because they're farmed. And people say, oh, I need my protein from meat. Well, for a start, you can get it from everything in the plant world and without any of the antibiotics, growth hormones, saturated fats, you know, that harm our health and feed are pathogenic bacteria. So it's about keeping that balance and and then all of a sudden your body looks after you and you're like, oh, and your cravings stop because what is very interesting about the gut microbiome is that when pathogenic bacteria take over, there's two things that they do. 
they excrete their own endotoxin. So that's the bacteria excrete their own toxin, a lipopolysaccharide, which feed off mucin, the mucus layer that lines our gastrointestinal tract, then causes gastro hyper permeability, which is aka leaky gut, or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth because the bacteria comes into the small intestine to feed off the mucus layer of a lining of our gut, creating more inflammation and more uh, issues, sort of like having a house with bricks and mortar and the mortar starts eroding and all of a sudden water and everything is coming onto the inside wall and it's starting to bubble and break and crumble. And that's exactly what's happening so one it does that and two what it says is okay i need to make sure i'm getting enough food because the pathogenic bacteria are only interested in survival they don't care they give a rat's ass about you so what they do is they manipulate host eating i.e you're the host they send messages to the brain to manipulate what you eat so that you will eat more sugar more processed to keep them alive so it's very amazing how they work. So you have to have a mechanism in place that doesn't feed them, but at the same time basically gives a massive amount of food to your beneficial bacteria and different types of fibre. And this is where most people get it wrong. They'll just eat a plant-based, but they'll only eat one type. And so it's they're eating a big, broad range of foods that keep this base core commensal beneficial bacteria and it starts them growing and then all of a sudden you've got this instead of 80 percent pathogenic bacteria that are eating you from the inside out you start and 20 percent beneficial you start getting 80 percent beneficial and 20 percent pathogenic and these good guys they repair the mucus layer because they build up the epithelial cells and so all of a sudden you find oh, I'm no longer pinging. My immune system is no longer pinging. What happens? No asthma, no hay fever, no eczema. And it, it, so why we think it's a miracle and you're like, aha, it's a miracle that this has happened, it isn't when you know the actual scientific sort of breakdown of how these bacteria act. That, that's how they work, Yeah. Oh, I could wrap it on all day. God, it's just incredible. I, I, um, in the pre-interview, we were ta- Natalie and I were talking, and this is something that I learned about just after I had my worst attack with MS. I went numb from the waist down, and I went to a GP, and I said, he said, "Oh, you know, this is what we do." And I said, "Yeah, but why is it happening? Like, why is it happening? Tell me." And he said about 70% of your immune system is in your micro is is in your microbiome. So if your microbiome and we went down the testing and I found out that I had zero good bacteria and gazillions of bad bacteria and he's like this is probably why this is happening to you and I was stunned. Yep. And the thing is, is that people think, oh, well, I'm doomed, but you're not because your actual commensal core bacteria, your beneficial bacteria, actually do two things. One, they become dormant. So they don't die completely. They just basically become so sick and weak, almost like you were with your legs not moving and me laying in bed. It's like, I can't do anything. I can't eat anything. You know, I'm too tired. So that's one thing they do. The next thing they do is To ensure their survival and that they don't die, they become pathobionts. They become like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And they go, look, those pathogenic bacteria seem to be getting fed really well. So what they do is they put on a pathobiont. So if you can imagine a green ball of beneficial bacteria, they put on a red suit of pathogenic bacteria and they masquerade and they go next to the pathogenic bacteria. Hi, guys. And the pathogenic bacteria go, oh, you're one of us. Come, come and eat. And they stay alive by eating your mucus layer. But when you give them the food that keeps them alive, when they start seeing the fibre come, they go, oh, thank God, there's my food. And they take off their red coat and they go back to being the beneficial bacteria. So they're very smart. So they don't die. 
as we previously thought, they become low in numbers and they become very weak. And when the even when at first little bits of bacteria, they, they're like babies. They're like, I can't eat that. You've got to mush it up for me. It's almost like I've had chronic fatigue syndrome clients that go, I just I can't even get out of bed to eat. So we're like, okay, let's work on all these types of smoothies with different types of fibre and you can lay there with a straw in your mouth and just suck on that. But we've we've broken it down into its very finer components so that by the time it gets into your large intestine, your little weak beneficial bacteria who are just as weak as you go, oh, thank you for mushing it up and cutting out, almost like a mother eagle that has eaten the food digested it and then vomits it. I know it's a gross analogy, but they vomit it up for the babies because it's pre-digested. So that's what you do. So there's, there's, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. I've worked with all matter of clients that we go, okay, we're going to do the gut rebalancing protocol and we're going to tweak it for you because we're going to do more mushy stuff, more smoothie based, more this based, or okay, you're somewhere in between. And it, or even for someone that goes, yeah, look, I just want to get the last of these meat or things out of my diet for whatever reason, health, religious reasons, animal cruelty, whatever. But what I say to people is, and one of the things I think that stops a lot of people, and it did really make me think about it, was, and it was a constant thing, was I know my family and friends cared for me, but they kept saying, oh, you can't just eat vegetables, you'll get sick. And I was like, but I am sick. I am sick. And I've been doing what you're doing, so I've got nothing to lose here. But it almost became an imposition for to do things. They're like, oh, you're coming out for dinner, so what, do you, what can I make? So I would just go, I'll bring something that we can all share. So you're going to put something on the table, so I'll bring food to share. So what I encourage my clients is is to take dishes, to don't talk about it, but just do about, just do it because sometimes people like to have an argument about it and I don't want to have an argument. I'm just wanting to go, this is about me. This is about being in the aeroplane and it's the air pressure has dropped and I have to put that mask on me first because I can't help anyone else. So I say to my clients and I say to anyone that's out listening, this is about you. You need to look after number one first because if you don't, you can't look after anyone else. Look where you were. If you hadn't have looked after yourself, how could you have looked after your kids? I mean, I couldn't look after my three kids. My husband had to go to work, do it, had to take each of the kids. I had one kid in primary school, one in high school, one at university. I had, he had to cook all the meals. He had to do lunches. He had to organise everything while I laid in bed, motionless. So how is that helping anybody? So a lot of people say, oh, but if I do this, it's going to be disruptive for the household. Well, how is being sick? not disruptive as how is things not disruptive yeah i think a lot of people that i've seen as well they say oh you know it's difficult for this reason or we can't afford it and i'm like but can you afford to be sick like being sick isn't really financially viable either i was going to the chiropractor every week 60 dollars a pop two or three times a week not to mention anti-inflammatories and all the rest of it now i take nothing not a vitamin not a not zero nothing I don't I spend my money on getting a massage because but I don't need the care and I'm lucky because one one son's a chiropractor and the other son's a remedial massage therapy so scoop there I do going into behavioral science and the mind stuff so when I go crazy I've got her to uh, uh, uh covered um but the thing is is that yes it is and I say when I put this to my clients and they start buying all these things, no vegetable, no nuts and seeds are more expensive than meat and fish. Fish is $22 a minimum a kilo. We buy little slithers and we think, oh, that's only $4. But when you look at the per kilo, it's $22. Meat, okay, you can get a cheap cut for, you know, $12. But most of it hovers around $18, $24, $34 a kilo. Vegetables aren't that. 
nuts aren't that, seeds aren't that. You know, all those things don't cost as much. But when you're really stocking your pantry for the very first time, yes, it can be. But as you, you, you're you using more of those, you realise, oh, my God, you know. And I teach people how to make beautiful meals like nachos with Mexican bean chilli and cashew cheese sauce and having beautiful meals like mushroom leek risotto or mushroom walnut bolognese and all these sorts of things made with beautiful whole foods that take 20 minutes to make. Uh, so it's not about spending. I think people think, oh, I've got to spend more time in the kitchen. Oh, I've got to, it's going to cost me too much. But they, that's not, not to say there isn't, because when you don't have spices in your, in your pantry or you don't have certain things and you've got to get them for the first time, they are. But these things last longer and they're not full of the growth hormones. And, you know, our meat, even if it is grass-fed and it's, you know, been roaming around, it's certainly not grass-fed all year. It's, there's, we don't have grass all year round. So they're fed corn and soy and very high inflammatory omega-6s. Then when they go to the abattoirs or they're put on trucks to go to abattoirs and they sit in pens for three or four days, they have to be given antibiotics, antifungals, antimicrobials and, and antibacterials because of the spread of disease and because they're on in trucks and they're pooping on each other's heads and they're standing in their own excrement, you know, for days sometimes. And so we are ingesting those. And... Second hand, we're wiping out our beneficial bacteria because every time you have a dose of antibiotics being first hand or second hand, you are wiping out and, and damaging your commensal bacteria. You know, you're not wiping out and killing them. You're basically going down. And look, I don't know who's in charge, the greater being of you believe in God or whoever. Whoever did it got it wrong because they made our pathogenic bacteria stronger. It's like weeds. I don't know why, but my weeds grow beautifully in my garden. But does my spinach grow that well or my basil or my oregano? No, that's just the way it is. And so, yes, beneficial bacteria are a bit more delicate and they need more care. But once you get your garden flourishing, see, I can go away for a weekend. So once I plant this beautiful garden, my inner garden is flourishing. And if, pe if people can imagine a beautiful garden out the front full of spinach and basil and mint and a gorgeous thing, and there's hardly any weeds because there's no room for them, I could go away for a weekend or even a week and they would still be okay. But I can't go away for a month because they don't. They need my care, so I can go away and I think, oh yeah, I might have a bit of a weekend with having some fries. I mean, I don't go back to ever eating cheese on pizzas or you know a steak or anything like that. I mean, that doesn't even that's not even in my repertoire. But I might go away and you know I'd be having a bit of promite slathered on to some Turkish bread or something like that. So it doesn't mean living like you know a lettuce leaf saint. You can eat beautiful things, but you can afford to sort of just go away for a couple of days, but you soon feel it, even with that. What's really amazing is I will wake up and I think, oh, yeah, I'll have that, or we go out for breakfast, and I think, oh, yeah, I'll have that, something, some type of bread or whatever, and all of a sudden I feel it. And it's almost like I've given the pathogenic bacteria something to eat, and they're like, woohoo, thank you, and my beneficial bacteria is sitting there, sort of with their arms wide open going, hello, hello, food for us, where are you, you know. So I now crave celery. I crave a carrot sticks. I, I, I open the fridge and I think, oh, I'm going to munch on that, you know, and can make beautiful dressings with pine nuts and, you know, a bit of apple cider vinegar and pine nuts and some basil and oregano and all those sorts of things to make whole food dressings that, and when I take it, the, the, the laughing matter of it is, is I get invited to dinners and people go, oh, it's going to be so hard, you know, can you bring something? And I bring something and guess what? Everybody eats my meal. They go, oh, this is so good. And they eat my meal and I've got hardly, I've learned to bring double batches because. You have to bring double batches. I, I, and I get a bit like, 
a psycho about it. Like, I yeah. see they go, oh, no, they're eating all of the one thing I've bought. That's the only thing I can eat. <laughs> and, and another thing, and that you just said it, the only thing I can eat, and and I and I have to change what I say, the only thing I can eat, it's the only thing one I want to eat. eat. I know. I've learnt that too, and I'm really trying to change my language about it because it is – it isn't you can't eat it, it's that you don't want to eat it. Like I can I can absolutely eat every single thing here. I wouldn't because I really value my body and my health and being able to feel my legs. But yeah, I have I have to say, I have really noticed that people say, Oh, you can't eat that. Oh sorry, you can't eat this. And I've t- I say, Yeah, I can't eat that, but it's not that. It's no, I don't, don't want to eat it. I don't want to eat it. And so so, yeah, so what, you know, from having transformed my own health and then helping clients do that, you know, I can teach them about, you know, mine's about education. Where did, where does B12 come? Where does calcium come from? Are you going to get enough protein? All these sorts of things, fallacies that have taken over uh, the marketing. It's like the – I was just doing research about a talk I'm doing next week about protein, myths and facts, and <laughs> so many myths – but it was very much like the low-fat diet that came on the 70s. It came out of one study that showed a, a correlation between saturated fat with LDL, the harmful cholesterol. And so it became the low-fat diet of giving, you know, increasing the sugars and, and taking out all those fats and having the meat with, every, you know, the fats cut off it and all the rest of it. And we saw the highest increase of heart disease, um, obesity, uh, statistics went through the roof. This was based on one study. And it wasn't until 30 years later that everyone said, oh, sorry, it made a mistake. Now, it's the same mistake. It was like cigarettes in the 50s where we told pregnant women to smoke because they'd have babies that were smaller. And the same things that are going around now where programs on TV are yelling out to contestants, okay, contestants, go and get your protein. And your protein is meat, fish, milk and that. And we can't believe that there's that actually protein is stored by those animals because they eat the grass because plants make protein from a synthesis of nitrogen in the soil and carbon in the air. And they do it, then we eat the milk. So every plant product has got protein. And so the myth was there is none or you're not getting uh, high quality. And that was another myth. It was something in the 19th century that they said that the rich were eating meat and the poor were eating plants, so they termed it high quality and low quality because poor equated with low standard of living and rich it was high standard of living they were eating meat. But what we know now, that's not the case. I want to just interrupt with two things that you talked about. One was a lot of people I see online say, oh, you know, you can't get complete proteins on a plant-based diet. So could you talk a bit more about that, this idea that, you know, we're unable to get complete proteins, all the amino acids and stuff balanced on a, on a plant-based diet? So basically there's about 20 amino acids and they're basically the building block. So if you look at a wall, that's your whole complete protein and each brick is amino acid. Well, 11 of those are already standing. It's like the house, it already it built itself, our body makes them. And nine of them, we've got to go and collect those bricks and put them on to complete that wall, that complete protein. Now, it is true that meat and most uh, dairy products and things are, are a complete protein in that they supply those nine essential amino acids at one time. Plants provide the exact same amino acids because that's where the meat got them from, but in individual components. Now, it doesn't matter if I pick up those nine bricks at once and plonk them on that brick wall or I bring one brick at a time and plonk them on that wall because what the body does is any protein it gets in its body, it basically splits it into individual amino acids. So it disassembles and then reassembles based on the body what it needs. So even if it is a complete protein from a meat source, it disassembles that into individual 
amino acids and it says, okay, this tissue protein needs it, we need that protein there. And then it rebuilds it somewhere else. So if you're eating a plant-based diet and you get one, you know, um, leucine and all these different amino acids, a bit from avocado and a bit from lettuce and a bit from sweet potato, a bit from that, it comes into the body. It's already in small chains. It disassembles that and then it says, I'll store that and I'll send it that. And it holds, the body holds proteins for 14 days and keeps disassembling and reassembling. So like your brick wall, it doesn't matter that you plonk them all there at once at the foot of the of the wall and go, okay, there's all your bricks at once, or I bring them one by one. I can still com- make a complete protein out of smaller. And plant proteins, because plants are easier to digest, we don't get the issues with digestion. Also, we get the added bonus of, hey, fibre feeds up bacteria. When we eat a piece of meat, there's zero fiber. And most people, the way, the lifestyle they lead and eating fast and all the rest of it, they actually don't produce enough hydrochloric acid, which then in turn activates pepsinogen, which then activates pepsin to break down those protein molecules. So unless you're, you've got an amazing, excellent digestion, you're not even breaking down those complete proteins. They actually can pass through undigested, which then causes fermentation in the gut. So if anyone sits is out there going, yeah, actually I get gas and, gas and bloating and I, I have this feeling of this fullness after a meal, like food is sitting in my stomach, guess what? You're not breaking down those proteins. And after one and a half of two hours in the stomach, gastric emptying, it gets passed through and once it hits your small intestine, it's not getting breakdown because it has to be cleaved off and basically broken up into different, into smaller strands in the stomach. So, yeah, so the complete protein thing doesn't stand true and even the myth that complementary proteins, you had to have it in one meal. So you had to combine a bit of rice, a bit of corn, whatever, is a fallacy. Then they, they went, it had to be in one meal. Then the science went, oh, sorry, we realised it was in a 24-hour period. We now know it's a 14-day opening. Wow. I did not know that. In 14 days, you're going to eat every single in everything you do and you're going to get all the protein requirements. And, in fact, I've done counts of what I get for my protein and for my age, for my weight, I should get about 48 grams of protein a day and I tend to be always over, which is not necessarily a good thing because protein isn't what fuels us. It builds muscle tissue and it's very important, don't get me wrong, but it's certainly not what is, you know, the essential part of our diet. Fibre, plant-based fibres are what it what it is so yeah that's it's a huge myth one thing left on that and that well there's two things one would be i heard that quinoa was a complete protein is that true look they haven't the jury's still out on a lot of these they don't believe that quinoa and even amaranth is exactly a complete protein if you look at different i've looked at different sources some that say that it is and some that say that it isn't so it hasn't had enough research done. Into but it. what I say to people is, okay, one, you don't even know what protein is, so why are you worried about it? Two, all you need to do is have a wide variety. Forget about, oh, I've got to have this much protein. Oh, I need this type of much carbohydrates. Am I having this much fats? Forget about it. Guess what? In the 60s when I was born, no one worried about it and everybody was healthy and no one was obese. But now we're obsessed. Protein, fats, carbs, you know, this and that, and we're all unhealthy. I say to people, forget about that. Wake up in the morning, have a smoothie, stick all different things in. If you're worried about your protein, put a cup of peas in there. There's your, your protein. That's Forget about your, your protein isolates from some stupid supplement that costs you $70 when a $2 pack of peas is going to cost you 20 cents for a cup, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a wide range. And I don't think about it, but every so often, you know, people worry about me, family and friends, and I go, okay, and I list it up because I have a program, you know, a dietitian sort of nutritional program that lists what I'm doing, 
and people can do it in, with my fitness pal or any of those apps. Yeah, but, chron- chronometer, I think you yeah, can do it with I put, as well. I put it in there and I'm never struggling in my proteins and I'm certainly never struggling in meeting all my essential amino acids. And the next thing I was going to say, because you said that you don't take any supplements or anything anymore, what do you do for B12? How do you make B12? Because everyone's wondering about B12. Okay, so sorry, I should have said, I, I, you know what, I don't think about that as um, a supplement. Generally, I will get things like nutritional yeast that is fortified. So I suppose that is. Now, one thing is, is that people don't have to worry because the liver the adrenals and even parts of the kidney store B12 for three to five years. So there's no chance that you're going to have a B12 deficiency. And I always say to people, before embarking on, you know, stuffing B12 supplements down your your neck, go and get your bloods done and see where you are. Because if they're really high, there is a danger in over supplementing and having very high B12 levels. So you don't want that. So first get it checked out by a doctor, see where your levels are if you're worried. Okay, if you've been vegan for one or two years, that's where you need to start thinking about it. Uh, Fortified nutritional yeast. And what I tend to do is once a month, I have a sublingual B12 spray that is from vegan sources because B12 is actually, again, from bacteria in the soil. It actually isn't from animals. Animals graze in grass. They pull out a big chunk of grass or chickens peck in the in the soil. They take in that B12 bacteria that's in the soil and they store it in their body. We eat them. But interestingly enough, and I see it in my clients all the, 12, all the time because I say, look, go and get your bloods done. Let's see where you are with B12, iron, all those things, inflammatory markers, especially if they've got things like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and all those things. I say, let's find out where all your inflammatory markers are, your ESR and CRP and all those things. And my meat eaters are B12 deficient and my vegetarians and vegans aren't. And the reason is that, is that because our meat nowadays is no longer being grass-fed. They're just in troughs eating corn. They're not digging in the ground or not digging in the ground enough. They're not ingesting B12. Our chickens, who we get our eggs from, are no longer pecking in the ground and they're supplemented a lot in their diet with corn and soy and that. So, Yeah, it's very interesting because I had to have B12 injections before when I was a meat eater, when I was like 22, really unhealthy. And then since being plant-based, I've had great B12 ever since. So it's very funny. So I say to people, I get my, look, I always get, I've got a great doctor. He's brilliant. I don't, I'm certainly not poo-pooing Western medicine. I think it's great. I always say to people, having a heart attack, you go see your doctor, don't come see your naturopath. (laughs) But there's a really great place for medicine and I've got a great uh, doctor and we get it checked every week because I, my health is important to me and I want to be on top of where is my iron, where are those things, because even non-heme iron, you can get enough iron, you just have to eat double the amount. So your body can take enough, but it's actually you've got to do double the amount and then you've got to look at factors of like drinking teas and coffees too much, which reduce iron or adding in vitamin C. So again, my biggest iron deficient people have been meat eaters and not vegetarians and plants. I was just going to chime in because it sounded like you said you check in with him every week. Is that what you said? Sorry, every, every year. Sorry, once a year. No. Yeah, once a year. But once a year. Sorry, I go and get my bloods done every year. Every I just turn – I'm due for it now. What I always do is I book in around my birthday. So I just turned 54 and I book in and I get all my bloods and, you know, pap smears and all those, you know, things done. And – I've been this way now. I've been, uh, I suppose, yeah, predominantly plant-based now for maybe four years, but previous to that a bit longer, so starting when I was about 47. And another thing was all my – I started, I went through menopause young. I was about 47, massive hot flushes, like just shocking, um, you know, libido up and down, feeling like shit, you know. Um, and that went away with plant-based. 
and it's because our beneficial bacteria have a role in transporting hormones and clearing excess estrogen from the liver. They clear, they help, and obviously a plant-based diet, there's less toxins in them so that the liver clearance is very easy, the hepatic uh, pathway and detoxification pathways one and two are supported because I'm giving them the B6 and the zinc and the selenium that is abundant in plant, which is often not abundant in meat products. So when you start feeding your body the nutrients it needs, all of a sudden it just get, it goes, bloody hell, where have you been? Jeez, thank God you finally gave us what we needed. Now I can do my job. It's almost like trying to run a car without petrol. Oh, but I've given, I've got oil in the engine, I've got water in the radiator, I've polished the outside, the inside's gorgeous, and I've, you know, buffed all the, the seats and beautiful seat covers and a vacuum, but it won't go. Uh, you're missing the petrol. So if you don't look after all aspects of it, then it struggles. So really, if you look after your beneficial, when they flourish, you flourish. When they struggle, you struggle. And just in the last couple of days, my husband and I were saying we, we got a bit lax with things and we were still eating plant-based, but I think, you know, we went out a bit more often and so you tend to sort of have things that maybe have some sauces in it and certain things because I'm not a real sort of... I was going to ask you about sauces. I think that people who are listening may want you to clarify. When you're talking about sauces, explain what you mean because it, it, it might be very obvious to us, but it might not be obvious to people who are listening what so, what, what sauces means. So, I, I mean, like I often go, I'll go and get uh, Mexican and I'll get um, on, I will get a, you know, a sautéed vegetables with guacamole and black beans on, on some corn chips and that's a real treat and then every so often they say um oh do you want the mild sauce and I generally say no sauce but sometimes I forget and they have it well that sauce has got to keep a sauce for a long period of time to keep it it's, it's got preservatives emulsifiers and and generally non-food items things that your body doesn't recognize and they feed pathogenic bacteria because our body can't utilize them as a food source so I will have the, like, I'll have some apple cider vinegar and then I'll put together, I'll make my own sauce and dressing from, like, I make a beautiful divine green dressing out of, like, basil and um, uh, parsley, kiwi fruit, um, uh, well, oh, I can't remember, some pine nuts and things like that, and I'll blend it all and that's a beautiful dressing or sauce. But when you eat out things like, a barbecue sauce, a tomato sauce. One, they often contain gelatin, which is a meat-based thickener. They often have the wheat and just like shitty wheat, not the good, you know, good sauce. But they're basically sauces that are full of preservatives and emulsifiers. That They're not a whole food. Okay. My husband is going to be editing this and I love it when he has to listen to it over and over again because he's not quite on board the plant-based thing he thinks I'm brainwashing him with this podcast because he's listening to it on repeat but I wanted to know tamari tamari sauce is that yes I use it it's fine like I said I don't use it all the time so what people tend to do this is like this coconut oil uh uh think crazy around and everyone was putting in their bulletproof coffee and then they were having it in their smoothie. That's just not, that's crazy. That's really bad for your health. Yes, I have a bit of tamari, but I might add it. I made a ginger sesame dressing yesterday with grated ginger, garlic, chili, bit of tamari. And so I've mixed all that up, but I'm not using it every day. But tamari is a fermented soy without the wheat. So when they're fermented, they're a much healthier choice. Whereas in, if you look at the ingredients of soy sauce, it's basically wheat, caramel, da-da-da, a bit of soybeans, but there's lots of other things. So, it, And the same thing, my husband, the same. He was like, well, don't expect me to be on this plant-based thing. And I'm like, oh, do what you want. I don't care. So we had two meals cooking in our house. And now he is... I would say probably 95% plant-based, slips up every so often. But last night he went to visit a friend who is a big meat eater and he was going down to the local pub having a few beers and I said, so, hun, you know, you're having your beers but, like, balance it with something healthy because I know that local pub's got great salads and you don't have to have the gunky, saucy dress, whatever. 
And he 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 came back and he said, oh, I didn't have the salad. I was like, oh, what did you have? Because he's been known to have like a chicken wing. Palma. Something like that, yeah. And he said, no, I ordered um, a pizza with a margarita pizza with no cheese. And he said, and I said, oh, my God. And he said it was so yummy and my friend really enjoyed it too and it was great. And even the waiter was like, what? You're having a pizza without any cheese? And he's like, yeah. And he said it was great. It was piled on with like sort of tomato and basil and it was great. So just in the last couple of weeks, he we went out to – it was his birthday and he we went out to Japanese and he had some fried chicken and some other things on the rest of it. And within a couple of days of eating that way, one, the cravings came back. Two, his hay fever came back with a vengeance. So he's like, bugger that. And he went straight back on to doing it. So he sees the benefits. I don't need to say anything anymore. You don't need to. It's, fu- it's so funny because I was very much, ah, at the start, like a little wasp stinging him. Because you and only want the best for them, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you love him so much, you know. I love him so much. And I'd noticed, so I thought, here, it's great. You do it too. Yeah. And he was just like. La, 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 la. <laughs> I always say to him, I want to keep you alive longer so I can torment you another day. And he's like, oh, thank you, darling. Now he's better. Yeah, he's better. He allerg- allergies every day, medication every day. And now he's lost weight, lost the allergies. Yep. Feels better. And so now when he's out, he'll say, oh, you know, my friends ordered a cheap four cheese pizza and, you know, it felt disgusting. And you can see him is just shifting. He's probably, our house is plant-based, but when he's out, which is very rarely, he'll eat whatever's there going. But My husband does, but he just do it. And, like, I mean, I even, I'll make dressings. I went for lunch with a friend and I checked the restaurant before and it had a beautiful falafel uh, things and a beautiful salad, but it had tzatziki, which is a, um, a yogurt dressing. So I thought, okay, I'll make my own. I make this beautiful Cleopatra dressing, which has got a bit of tamari, a bit of miso, a bit of pine nuts. It's celery. It's super, super yummy. So I put that in a little container. And when I ordered, I said, look, no tzatziki on mine. So they didn't put it on, but my friend had hers on. And so I was dipping mine into my own dressing. And she's like, let me taste that. And she was like, oh, I want some of yours. And I'm like, oh, I didn't bring enough, like, you know. (laughs) And I, you know, people say, oh, isn't that bothersome? And I'm like, no, you know what's bothersome? Is having hay fever, sleeping with ice packs, having hot flushes, being 15 kilos heavier, having backache, having spent. I, I got to my limit for a chiropractor with HBF every year. I mean, thank God. My, and that was getting like just swiping the card because my son was a chiropractor. Within six months, I'd used all my benefits. So it was cheaper and less time-consuming because I all of a sudden had all this time on my hand because I was no longer sick and having to freeze things or going to buy antihistamines or go down the shop and, you know, do all of this stuff, that my time has been freed up. So I say to people, you sometimes I sort of entrap my clients because they say, oh, I didn't have time. And so I talk to them and I say, oh, are you watching this on Netflix or are you watching that? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, right, you did have time. You <laughs> are, you're choosing that. So I say to people, carve out a few hours on the weekend, make some seeded crisp bread, make a couple of dressings for the week, cut up your, th- your veggies, make a couple of great big salads and bang, you know, chickpea patties. So it's it's so easy that now we're able to, we come home from work and we go exercising every night, go down to the beach, walk along the beach. I didn't have time for that before. Mm. because I was down the shop, oh, buy a sauce, get this, do that, I've got to cook the meat, all the rest of it. It's, yeah. So I, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to preach to everybody, but what I'm saying to them is that really the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result, and I was insane. I was having the yoghurt every morning and my can of tuna and the th- and going, but I'm eating healthy, I'm eating healthy, you know. Well, it wasn't working. So what does it hurt to try something for 56 days? And on that note, I wanted to say two things. What would be your three biggest tips for readers that are considering taking on this lifestyle? You already mentioned get some community, but what else would there be? 
Okay, so get community first. So get like-minded people. So join groups on Facebook or people so that you can ask their advice of people that have been there and done that. Because if you want to learn something, you don't talk to someone that doesn't know anything about it. You don't talk to your meat any friend. You talk to people that are eating plant-based. So join those groups on Facebook. The next thing is, is stop shopping at your supermarket. So challenge yourself for one month to only shop at the markets. Uh, so things that have just all it is is fruit and vegetables. Sometimes they'll have a butcher section to the side, but generally they're just all big fresh food markets. And just buy different things. Like pick up a fennel bulb and go, I don't even, I picked it up and I don't even know what to do with this. Pick it up, come home and Google it and go fennel bulb and do what it is and try it. And most times out of 10, you'll be amazed at how many. So that's the second thing is shop at the markets. Give yourself a challenge to do that. And thirdly is is that take spend a day inside your pantry cupboards. Spend a day or a weekend, like you would go through your wardrobe. You remember how you make that transition between summer and winter and you go through and like, oh, I didn't wear that last year, I'll flip that out and I'll put my summer clothes here at the front and winter at the back. Go into your pantry and take everything out and have a read of your labels and see what's in there. And when you see it's got 423, 24, 17, 415, all these sort of numbers, look them up, see what they are, and then go, hang on a second, what am I really using that for? Well, I'm using that tomato sauce to put on a piece of meat, and I'm not having the meat anymore, I'm going to ditch that, and I'm going to see what life is at. And if you think that you can't, because I do it sometimes, I've got a sweater in my cupboard and I haven't actually worn it for four years, but I love it to death. I got it in Tokyo and it's my favourite, And but I don't know why. I don't use it. So I say to people, if you've got a love in that pantry of your barbecue sauce or something that you go, but I'm in love with it, put it in a box, <laughs> transport it to your laundry cupboard and just put it away. Don't throw it out. Just put it away, out of sight, out of mind. And only go to it if you go, I need it, I need it, I need it, I need it. You know, but other than that, you might find that you don't need it because you can taste a flavour of a food because I tell you what, veggies have got amazing flavour sensations. So, yeah, I think that would be my my three go-tos to to, to help you tr- translate, you know, trans. There are three great tips I really like them I like the I always ask the three tips and as you always think after a while they're going to be the same tips because but they're not they're all different it's a different spin and I'm really really enjoying which is why joining a community is so important because everybody it's like you know if you want to breastfeed properly you ask someone that is breastfeeding someone not someone that and I you know feel sorry for mothers that aren't able and if you don't want it that's fine that's not a thing but you if you want to learn you ask from someone well how do you do it and you go to a lactation specialist all the rest of it so Often people are asking the wrong people about these things. That's very true. And people don't know. And that's a really good tip as well, I think, is asking, don't ask the people who haven't done it. Ask the people who've done it, who are where you want to go. Don't ask people who are where you are. Ask the ones where you want to go. My, you know, my GP, you know, he's um, he's vego, but... You know, often, like he said, he says, look, he refers people to me because he says, oh, I know, I don't know, I didn't study nutrition. And so people keep going to their doctors for the answers. And, look, if you need medication and you've got some life-threatening thing or you need antidepressants or whatever, I'm a very big supporter of getting medication when you need it. But going to a doctor for nutritional advice is like taking your car to a fridge mechanic and say, can you fix it? And they go, well, I maybe know a bit about it, but I don't know. I can't really. Or taking the fridge to a car mechanic. Don't know the ins and outs. So find, you know, holistic nutritionist or, you know, naturopaths that, that resonate with you. I mean, I don't resonate with everyone because I call people on their bullshit. So I, I say to people, yeah, I don't accept that, you know, that's bullshit. Or I entrap them just to, you know. But my job is to make them healthy. And you know what it's like with your kids. If you've got a job to do, you do what you need to do to get the job done. And so my job is to make them healthy. So I'm doing it. On that that topic, 
Yeah. I want now's the end of the interview time because yeah. people people will just block out. So I just really want you to talk about your job, how people, how people can work with you, where they can find you, your website links, your work, how they can get in touch because I think that people are people going to listen and be like, I have to work with Natalie. She's the lady for me. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so if you don't mind my, my Tourette's type swearing or something like that, but Voi is the name of my company, which is V-O-I, and Voi means you in Italian, and I chose that because it's all about you, and I really want people to think about themselves in this process. So it's www.voi.com.au, and I run health programs, um, gut rebalancing protocols that introduce people to plant-based but at the same time rebalance their gut so very good includes sort of a FODMAP so really great for people that have irritable bowel or um, inflammatory bowel diseases autoimmune all those sorts of things and I run eight-week courses and people can choose the level of support they need so if they're saying already vegetarian but want to go the full hog plant-based and not have any you know sort of eggs or dairy I have a self-starter plan where they get all the meal plans recipes shopping lists so all they have to do and it caters for one two three or four serves so people don't have to every recipe every shopping list caters for any family size or any individual so all they do is they get the shopping list and it says avocado one and i don't have foods on there like they've got to go to the amazon and get some bloody berry that you can't <laughs> find. it's all normal food that's what i always say i, always, I don't have like the dalai lama's tears for ten thousand dollars and a unicorn's horn shaving exactly <laughs> that. it's all real stuff and so they take that, the shopping list, they go, they put the meal plan on the fridge. It's it's not a prescriptor saying you must eat this Monday or you must eat this Tuesday. It's about it's got a method in there that they choose what they want and dinners become their lunches. So it's very time efficient because it's made for people like myself that are busy and, you know, mums with kids or people that have got, you know, grandkids or stuff. And then um, all the recipes are there for you. And then they get online support 24-7 in a group, in a private group that they can ask me, a naturopath nutritionist, about any question relating to their health or their journey and also with other like-minded individuals that say, hey, I did this and this worked for me and this did this and et cetera. And then um, so that's a self-starter plan. Then I've got a support plan that has a bit more of a ramp up, which has got a fermented ebook. So teaching people how to make sauerkraut, kimchi, coconut yogurt, plant-based essentials, how to make non-dairy butter, cashew cheese, cream sauce, pizza bases, pizza sauce, all those sorts of plant-based. And then I have a personal plan which involves a one-on-one consultation. So it involves their initial consultation, a comprehensive health check, either face-to-face or I've got clients in, I've got a client in Canada, America, England um, that we do by Skype and it includes their um, initial, their follow-up, unlimited email support plus the group, plus the group, And um, if they need therapeutic probiotics, which you do do, and that's probably the only thing I do, and I don't class it as a supplement because what they are is they're like little worker bees that get in there and support your own. A supplement is thing is that is that you're putting in there that you're hoping will fill a gap. What therapeutic probiotics do is they basically work like a little personal training team for your good gut microbiome biome and it gets in there and goes what we'll do is we'll 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 mush this up first and then you can eat it so they they transient they're in there for three days and then you put them out but they work to basically sort of you know if you had chronic fatigue and you had your head down it's like someone lifting up your head and going here have a sip of water or have some smoothie it's the little helper worker bee so that's for people i've got people that have got osteoarthritis and things like that so there's a plan that suits all budget requirements. Um, and, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I just had a woman that posted Toot group. away, it's toot away. A girl, that lady that posted, she's got osteoarthritis, high inflammatory, um, ESR and CPI, if anyone knows C-reactive protein, inflammatory markers. And she's been on the program for four weeks and she posted in the group, she said, just had my bloods done, no inflammation, gone completely. Another, yeah, another lady that's uh, her sinusitis, she's had for 15 years, gone. Uh, Another lady that's had um, 
you know, weight issues and all the rest of it, 12 kilos gone. So, but I always say to people, focus on the little, and we do a personal health goal tracking and support and all the rest of it, and it's about celebrating the little wins. Oh, wow, I didn't wake up last night and scratch my arm. You know what I mean? It's not about, you're not going to wake up miraculously. It's like Tanya the Titanic. It takes time. But I, my thing, I knew that going one-on-one all the time was not going to reach as many people. And so if I went online and created programs that people could work through but still have me to say, hey, what about this? Or, hey, can I do this? Or, what about that? And, you know, I say, look, if you're in the chip aisle or the chocolate aisle of the, I'll walk you part off the ledge, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, that support. So it's been – I've been doing that now uh, for this year. Pre- previous to that, it was only available to clients one-on-one. Uh, but I just re- – I couldn't see enough people in a day. I mean, I was booked out and then with the follow-ups and all the rest of it, I was only down to being able to take, like, three new clients a week because of people's follow-ups and, and you know, and the work needed and unlimited email responses and that. So – I just thought, well, this is the way to help people. And since then, it's opened up and people, I'm, you know, getting these great changes. And so, yeah, it's, it's a de- basically it's a gut rebalancing protocol. It's a done-for-you protocol. You don't have to think. You don't have to go, bloody hell, what's for dinner tonight? What do the kids want? And like I say to people, if you've got some meat-loving people in the family that go, I'm not giving up this, then you say to them, look, you go go buy your beef strips and when I finish making uh, the beautiful Asian stir fry that's full of bok choy and baby corn and oysters and enoki mushrooms and not and oysters, oyster mushrooms and enoki mushrooms and, and all those beautiful greens, you can stir through beef in yours. So what people have found is that it's so versatile. If they've got someone in the family, but guess what? I say to them, Serve it up to them first, ask them to try it. If they don't like it, then let them add. And what they've said is all of a sudden the whole family's doing it. And like this lady, she said, been on it one week. Um, She's got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, just one step away from diabetes medication. Her doctor said, you got to do something. She's lost three kilos in one week, four centimetres around her waist, and she's pissed off because her husband's lost five kilos, who sat there and said to me, I'm not doing this. I'm eating meat as long as I'm not included. I said, look, buddy, we don't give a rat's ass about you. This is about your wife. You can do what you want. But he was like, oh, this tastes quite good. I might have it. And so she was a bit peeved that he lost more than her. But I said, I know it's very disappointing with men. Sometimes they lose it pretty quickly. But And that was in a week. And so she's like, I don't have to think. I just go into the shop, into the market. I buy whatever you tell me to buy. I put it in the fridge, in the thing. I put out the meal plan. I come home and go, hmm, I feel like a soup. Hmm, I feel like a salad. I look at that recipe. I make it. It's right there in front of me. It takes 20 minutes and I've eaten. Perfect. It's so good. It's whatever makes people it easy, yeah. So that, just to uh, refresh everyone's memories, was www.voi.com.au. And that means you in Italian, which I really like. It's all about you. Thank you so much, Natalie, for taking the time to talk with me about such a fascinating topic, which I hope that people have gotten a lot out of, as I did. I really, really loved it, and I can't wait to maybe incorporate a lot more variety onto my own plate because I find that I do get stuck in those ruts where you're eating similar meals all the time. So, yes, I loved hearing about all of the things that you share with us, but definitely going to take on board adding some more variety into my food choices every week. Next week's guest will be vegan psychologist Claire Mann from Vegan Voices. Uh, Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any of what Claire has to say. See you next week. Bye.